Makes us realize that it's just part of Allah's plan. Feeling stronger, we take it in our stride. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome back to our fourth episode of this exciting and amazing journey through our Islamic history. I'm Dr. Steph Karras, the author of the Forgotten Ottoman Heritage in Europe, the editor in chief of ilmonlinemag.com. A lecturer in several universities and educational institutions in Europe as well as in Africa. And I would like to show you with this episode, the fourth episode, that again, actually, I must say, that despite the fact that the Westerners and the Christians and the whole entire Western world is attacking Islam and the Muslims on a daily basis because we are so-called intolerant people and because our rulers and our rule in the past was intolerant, I would like to show you exactly the opposite now, actually. Especially with this episode, which focuses pretty much on Egypt and North Africa. Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, and Morocco. The North African countries which in general are considered, these are the countries which are considered part of North Africa. Now, there is no precise definition for North Africa because in other definitions you will also find Mauritania, part of it. You will also find Sudan, part of North Africa, and even the Horn of Africa. Now, we, I would like to stick more to the traditional understanding, Egypt and its neighbors, up to Morocco maybe. Now, the Muslims who, and I'm using the correct term here, the Muslims who opened Egypt and North Africa for Islam, they did not conquer it, they opened it. It was conquered by the Byzantines before. The Byzantines are the ones who actually imposed their rule and imposed their religion, Orthodox Christianity. And that's the reason why we can find in most of the Arab countries, nowadays even, the Christians, the Arab Christians, are mostly Orthodox Christians. They are not Catholics or Protestants. They are Orthodox Christians because the Byzantine Empire, the Greek Byzantine Empire, was nothing else but an Orthodox Empire, a Greek Orthodox Empire, and they were the ones who were ruling for a very long time the nowadays known Middle East, North Africa, at least parts of it. And they were the ones who had to be confronted by the Muslim rulers, by the Muslims, who entered North Africa after they had already captured the rest of the Arabian Peninsula, the Sham area, and now Egypt. Now, as we mentioned in the last episodes, what happened when the Muslims arrived in Egypt and in the rest of the North African countries? What did they do? Did they kill the Christians? Did they kill, kill also the Jews who were living here? Did they... Uh, conquer the countries in bloodshed? What exactly happened? This is according to a lot of sources and according to a lot of non-Muslim sources we can find that it's exactly the opposite. Okay? I'm not saying that they didn't fight and I'm not saying that no blood was shed. No. I'm saying that it was not in the way that it's described to us that the Muslims came like barbarians and conquered basically North Africa and killed everybody they found and especially the non-Muslims. Now this is not entirely true. When they arrived especially in Alexandria, which was and is still known as a haven for tolerance in Egypt, we know that in Alexandria, still nowadays, there is a big Christian community and that time the Christian community was of course bigger and when the Muslims arrived in Alexandria, they allowed the people of Alexandria, the Christians, they allowed them to basically be free and live and practice their Christianity in freedom. The first thing that the people, the Alexandrians did, they quickly recalled their exiled monophysite patriarch to rule over them. They called the patriarch who was not there, who was in exile. Now, 
I'm using a term which I've never used before, monophysite. What does it mean? It was a patriarch. The Orthodox Church believed, of course, in the Trinity. These people who are monophysites are the ones who basically believed in a specific way that Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, was. And they did not entirely embrace the Trinity. Now, I will not go into theological matters here and go deeper into religious affairs, but, but we just have to see that the Muslims, the Arab Muslims, allowed the Christian Arabs to bring the patriarch they wanted them, they wanted them to, to be ruled, to rule. So, the same, by the way, the same happens some <laughs> centuries later in Constantinople, Istanbul nowadays. The same in Constantinople. When Sultan Fatih opens Constantinople, he allows the monophysite patriarch to, to become the only representative of the Orthodox Church. And not only were these Orthodox patriarchs the representative of the Orthodox Church, but they were also the representative of the entire, entire Christendom in that area. And they had also political powers. So, we have to see that during the time of the Muslim rule, the Christian church, again, got some special rights. And nowadays, actually, these rights are not there. We have to see that the Christian church nowadays, the Orthodox churches anywhere in the world, don't have any political power as, 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 as in, in, in a way that it was that time. We have to see that basically the idea at that time that the state was interrelated with the the religion and with the background of the rule, the rule persons, that gave the churches the right to rule the subjects um, politically. Now, and that same happened again, that same happened in the Balkan when the Ottomans arrived on the Balkan Peninsula. And we will talk about it later, inshallah. Now, the Muslims ended Byzantine rule in Egypt. The Muslims ended Byzantine rule in Tunisia from 647 to 648, Morocco in 682, and then in the end, 670, the general Ogbal ibn Nafi was the one who established the city of Kairouan in Tunisia. The city of Kairouan played an important role because we can find in that city the great mosque the mosque that basically was known as the Mosque of Uqba, which has become the model of all the mosques in the Western Islamic world. With this one we mean from Tunisia on, basically Tunisia, uh, Morocco, Algeria. The Mosque of Kairouan was not only a mosque to pray in, not only to make salah, but it was a mosque that also educated people in any type of science. Okay, we have to see that, that the religious structure of the Muslim world was not just uh, like it was in the, Christian, in the Christian world, it still is in the Christian world, that the church is just there to pray, to worship and go home, but the mosque, the structure in Islam is like this, that the masjid is basically a place of worship as well as a place of education, as well as a place of learning. And... The Mosque of Kairouan played an important role, as well as other mosques throughout the world. In Damascus, we obviously know an example, uh, the, one of the best examples in Damascus and in Baghdad. All these areas and these centers of the Muslim world, they all were centers for education, for learning. If we find out later about Spain, Al-Andalus, we will also see that places like Cordoba, Sevilla, Granada, these are places in Spain which established the first universities in the world, and definitely in Europe. And this was done under Muslim rule, under Umayyad rule especially. Now, North Africa, there's a specific issue with North Africa which I need to mention here. North Africa, the indigenous people of North Africa, in general, were and still are the Berbers and not Arabs. The Arabs came later. The people who are living in Morocco, even nowadays, 80 to 90 percent of Morocco is basically Berber. Algeria, a very big percentage, which I don't know exactly, but we're talking between 60 and 80 percent. Algeria and Morocco, 
and even in Tunisia you will find some, but after the Arabization, and I don't use the word in a negative way, but after the Arabs came and settled in North Africa, up to Morocco, um, Arabic became an important language, but not only because of the Arabs, but because of Islam. The Berbers accepted Islam very willingly, okay, and they, after their acceptance of Islam, they accepted also the Arabic language. So that Berbers started speaking for purpose of governance, for purpose of administration, they started speaking Arabic. Although they were not Arabs, and still are not Arabs, they have their own languages, they have their own culture, and uh, they are very different kind of people to the Arabs, and we need to know that, because th what happens later is that this very area, and we will talk about it in another episode, inshallah, this very area was occupied by European powers, by French especially, by the French and even the British in Egypt, the Italians in Libya. And when these European powers came over, they played, they played out the card of Berber against Arab. Nowadays even, even nowadays, the French are playing around with the Berber nationalistic card, which is played out against the Arabs and against Islam. Now, again, we know the definition of Ummah nowadays. We know what it means to be part of the Ummah. It has nothing to do with color, race, even creed. It has to do with believing in Tawheed. It has to do with being Muslims and being part of the Muslim Ummah. So, a Berber has the same right like any Arab. An Arab has the same right like any Greek, like any Italian who has accepted Islam within the Muslim Ummah. They are part of the Ummah, and the Berbers had understood at that time. They even went that far with their zeal that they, in the end, even went to the Iberian Peninsula, which is nowadays Spain and Portugal. But inshallah, I'll see you after the break, inshallah, and we'll speak more about this issue. Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum. We are the Muslim Ummah, and each day that goes by, the harder we try, in gratitude we pray to Allah. Go ahead and recite from the beginning because I have a few comments on the previous recitation. It was great, but I would like to uh, share with each other uh, some comments on uh, a few letters. Uh, okay. So I would request you to recite from the beginning, Ya Shu'aib, please. Okay, أصدق لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم. Do not be afraid to say يشاء. Do not say يشاء. This is wrong. There is no such recitation. مثل الذين حملوا التوراة ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا بئس مثل القوم الذين كذبوا بآيات الله والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين Muslim Ummah And each day that goes by The harder we try In gratitude we pray to Allah Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wa Welcome back again to the fourth, ep fourth episode The second part of it after the break Now We spoke before the break about The North Africans who accepted Islam About the spread of Islam In North Africa up to Morocco From Egypt up to Morocco we spoke about the indigenous people living in North Africa at that time until nowadays who are the Berbers. The Berbers are not Arabs. They don't even speak Arabic. They didn't speak Arabic. They speak it nowadays, of course, many of them. But they have an own language which is called Berber. The Berbers, by the way, I would like to go deeper into the definition of the word Berber again. It's quite interesting because Berber comes from the word Barbar, barbarian basically, varvaros. The Greeks used to call them Berbers. 
which means, what does it mean? A Berber is nothing else but, in the definition of it, it means barbarian. Somebody who basically, the Greeks would say, var, 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 bar, bar. We don't understand their language, so they just say bar, bar, bar. So <laughs> basically, they're just saying something. We don't understand them. And for that reason, the Greeks gave them the name Berber. So basically, on the same level of a barbarian. Anybody who was not a Greek, that was their general mentality, anybody who was, and even nowadays still, is not a Greek, is a barbarian. So the Greeks had this mentality and this understanding of people who are not Greeks, and the Berbers were given this name. These Berbers, again, had their own language. They were not Arabs, and they are not Arabs, but they, pretty much at the beginning of the spread of Islam, already in 647, the very beginning, under uh, the Umayyad Caliphs, they already accepted Islam and they fully became part of the Muslim Ummah. They got integrated into the Muslim Ummah. And I use the word very consciously. I say integrated, not assimilated. They got integrated, which means what again? If we look back to the definitions that we had at the beginning, being integrated basically means you become part of a society with keeping your roots, keeping your language, keeping your culture, okay, and still be your own individual person, but be still a part and play a role in the society. And the Berbers didn't just play a small role in the society in the Muslim Ummah, but they played such a role that they were the ones, and we should not forget the, the name Tariq bin Ziyad, who was the one general who went to open Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, Al-Andalus. Tariq bin Ziyad, General Tariq bin Ziyad, is the one who set foot in nowadays Gibraltar. Gibraltar is nothing else but Jibr al-Tariq. Jibr al-Tariq, the mountain of Tariq. It's an Arabic word. So basically, Tariq bin Ziyad was the first Muslim who set foot in Europe, in Spain, and in Gibraltar nowadays, and gave the name Gibraltar to Gibraltar. Subhanallah, I'm not sure that many of us know that, but it's an amazing fact. It's an amazing fact, and this showed that Tariq bin Ziyad was, by the way, not an Arab, he was a Berber. He was not an Arab, he was a Berber. The Spanish-speaking inhabitants of the Iberian Peninsula, or the people living there, mostly Christians, they welcomed the Muslims there, and we will speak about it, inshallah, later. They welcomed them there in such a way that within some years, a very big percentage of Christian Spaniards accepted Islam, and Islam spread also in Spain in a very, very short time. Now, the Berbers were the ones who pushed Islam into Europe, and again, we don't want to nationalize this deen, as people do that, or as the Westerners do that. They even say, basically they call them Arabs. But again, the Arabs, was, the Arabs were a minority in that region, especially at that time. And the Berbers were the ones who spread Islam with such a zeal, because their interest was Islam, and not you know, their Berber identity or whatever. Their identity was being a Muslim. Their identity was, was being, being part of Islam. The, until nowadays, we will find in North Africa quite, um, quite some numbers of Christians as well as Jews. Many of the Jews um, left Morocco or Tunisia, Algeria, simply because, not during the time of uh, the Umayyads, they left uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, they left North, left North Africa after the establishment of the State of Israel. Basically, they left to go to their so-called homeland. So it was not the Umayyads who forced anybody to leave North Africa who was not a Muslim, uh, but this all happened much later. Christians, many of them had the right to stay Christians, to remain Christians, as many did, and to practice their faith freely and without any problems. We have to see that once the Muslims got hold of North Africa, they did not just stop in Morocco, they went further to the north of Africa, they went to Europe, up to France, and in the south they went further down 
to West Africa, Central Africa. An amazing situation for us Muslims to realize that we as Muslims, because it's the history of Islam, it's the history of Muslims, and I do identify myself with it, as well as a Berber would identify with its history, as well as an Arab would identify with its history. We have to understand that as Muslims, we are part of this history. This is our legacy. We are part of this history. And we have to understand why the Muslims had such a zeal, why the Muslims went up to Spain and Portugal and France. Okay? Now, as I said, and I keep saying every episode, we have to teach our children. We have to let them, we have to make them understand that these should be their heroes. Omar ibn al-Khattab, you know, Caliph Ali, you know, <laughs> the, the Uthman, radiallahu anhu. All these people, they should be our heroes. And first and, and, and for, foremost, of course, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we have to learn more about these people in order to be able to teach them, in order to be proud of them, in order to make our, our children be proud of their roots and of their heroes. It is important again, as I keep saying, that in the case of North Africa, we again see, we again see the tolerance of Islam. We also see that people accept Islam not because they are forced to. People accept Islam because they want to, because they realize what Islam is, because they see that Islam is the utmost, the, 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 the only deen on this planet, Allah's deen. Of course, I'm not saying that there have been people who, of course, um, made use of uh, a position that they can gain in the Muslim world just with, with being Muslim, with claiming that they're Muslim. And of course, there was hypocrisy, there was nifak. Of course, all these things happened even during the time of Rasulullah in Medina. But, but, as a majority, we have to realize, we have to see that the Muslim state and the Muslim rulers were ruling in a tolerant manner which we today do not see happening by, with many people. We see also that, that we are accused of, you know, the hostile environment and the Western media, we are accused of being intolerant, our deen being intolerant. So basically we, sh we, we can show people now that this is not the truth. And even if you don't want to show people, show it to yourself. Realize yourself that the deen is not an intolerant deen, that the Muslim ummah, you know, came to stay and it has attracted a lot of people. And we see that conversion was a very normal thing. Now, we see that the Berbers as a whole nation, as a whole group of ethnic group, again, we're coming back to the point of the Berbers were nothing else but an ethnic group, and they accepted Islam fully, mashallah, and took it further. Without the Berbers, we wouldn't have had the 700 years of Islamic rule in Al-Andalus, in Spain and Portugal, up to France and even Italy, Sicily. So we have to understand what the zeal of especially a convert can do. If we understand that North Africa became part of the Muslim Ummah and the North Africans became part of the Muslim Ummah pretty much at the beginning of Muslim rule under the Umayyads, which was at the very beginning of Muslim rule in um, the mid 7th century up to the end of 7th century. As I said, Byzantine rule stopped in Tunisia between 647 and 648 and in Morocco in 682. So basically Morocco opened to Islam in 682. That was towards the end of the 7th century, of course. So if we look at that, we see that how fast Islam spread, how fast the Berbers and the North Africans accepted Islam. And we will see later also that not only the North Africans, but also in the West, in the East, and in the Central Africa, we will find quite some tribes accepting Islam pretty fast, pretty quick, and wanting to be part of the Muslim Ummah because they realize what it meant and what it still means nowadays, because we do have a high conversion rate, not only in Africa, but all over the world and even in the Western countries, in Europe and in North America. Egypt played an important role because now Cairo has kind of is competing and has been competing with the big centers. 
Now, after Medina, as we said, the Umayyads made Damascus their capital. During Umayyad, Umayyad rule, Cairo opened, and we see that Cairo also became an important big capital, or it is the city around this area. Everything here in Egypt um, got an Islamic, let's put it that way, got an Islamic touch. Okay? Up to the 9th century, we see the Fatimids take over. The Fatimids establish um, the al -Azhar University. As I said before, this all changes later. The al -Azhar University becomes a Sunni center, um, and all this changes, of course. But Cairo played, starts playing an important role. Okay? The capital of the Abbasids after Damascus became Baghdad and not Cairo. But it's interesting to know that the Abbasids decided to make Baghdad their capital, okay? And there was a very um, kind of, there was a hostile game between the different dynasties that we have now. Suddenly, we don't, we have Muslims fighting against Muslims. Now, suddenly, the Muslim Ummah gets destroyed within itself. We're seeing people, Muslims, fighting against each other and against other Muslims. We're seeing sectarian tendencies. We're seeing that people are divided. The Muslim Ummah is divided, was and is divided until nowadays. We see that the Muslim Ummah gets destroyed from within. That's what will affect Spain and the Iberian Peninsula in general. And this is something that will destroy the caliphate in Spain and in Portugal and the Iberian Peninsula. But this is something, inshallah, we will discuss, of course, in the next episode, a very important point. Inshallah, I hope to see you in the next episode. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are the Muslim Ummah And each day that goes by The harder we try In gratitude we pray to Allah Chosen as part of the best of mankind we spread the word of Islam Every difficulty faced in our lives Makes us realize that it's just part of Allah's plan Feeling stronger, we take it in our stride We are the Muslim Ummah And each day that goes by, the harder we try In gratitude we pray to Allah Chosen as part of the best of mankind We spread the word of Islam Every difficulty faced in our lives